is the 11th day of February and the 18th day of Shabbat. I notice the uh, .org site still hasn't corrected it. It says 17th day because the website uh, hasn't uh, made the change to the 18th day, but it is by potential visibility the 18th day of Shabbat. And I, as I mentioned last week, uh, uh, that, that's what I have said, and, and we'll, we'll go with that at this time. Maybe we'll have to have a discussion on this in the future. But uh, the moon should have been seen uh, when the month began, but there was just cloud cover in Jerusalem, but there was, it could be seen everywhere else where there was a clear sky. So anyway, today is the 18th day of Shabbat by potential visibility reckoning. And the 11th day of February. I want to start out this morning by reading a, a letter I received, just uh, one letter today that I want to read, from a man who's had some trials in the past, he and his family, and we shared them with him a year or two or a few years ago, and we've pray, been praying for him and his family, and he received an amazing deliverance, he and his family. Now he says, uh, we have had another family trial, but God once again has delivered us. Indeed, great is God's mercy and faithfulness. The biggest lesson I have learned the past few years, and something we all need to learn, is to use God's past deliverances and mighty works to encourage us in faith, that he will once again deliver us from our current trials. This is one of the grassroots in Christian living. In Psalm, 90, in Psalm 77, it talks about feeling like the Lord has, has forsaken us and thinking he has cast us off forever, verses 7 through 9. But in verses 10 through 12, it tells us what to do when doubting God. That is to remember the Lord's works and wonders of old. Again, in 1 Samuel 17, verses 33 through 37, David used past times when God delivered him from bears and lions when he was keeping his father's sheep to press forward to fight Goliath, knowing that God would deliver him from the hand of this Philistine, too. Or we can be like the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Whenever they faced trials in the wilderness or conquering the promised land and so forth, they remembered not the Lord's hand in delivering them from past enemies. Psalm 78 verse 42. This whole chapter tells about Israel's lack of obedience and faith. Again in Psalm 106 verse 21 they forgot God their Savior which had done great things in Egypt. This attitude showed a complete lack of faith which itself is sin, that is, lacking faith is sin. As it says in Romans 14, verse 23, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. But it also leads to a great sense of hopelessness. If one can't depend on God, who can they depend on? If one will not be encouraged by God's great works, what will encourage them? There are many trials coming in these last days, great tribulation, and all we really have in the end is God's mercy, which endures forever, Psalm 118 and Psalm 119. Amen, he says. 
in the times ahead in this evil world, we really need to hold fast to God's word and remember his great works of redemption in our own personal lives as well as what he has done for all his people. You know, I that's a very nice letter and a very wonderful sentiment and thing to think about because we do need to remember God's mighty works. That's why God has us review his plan every year by keeping the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, which portrays ancient Israel coming out of Egypt and all the lessons of the Exodus and coming out from oppression and being delivered and having faith in God and learning to walk with God and keeping our eyes on the future as Israel had to keep their eyes on the promised land as they marched through the wilderness to arrive at the promised land and to keep our faith strong in Christ through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit of Christ. And we can make it. You know, we, we can make it. There's a song sung years ago by the carpenters. It's only just begun. And uh, the work of God has really just begun. It's just beginning. He's working a work in our lives, and he will complete it if we allow him to if we are submissive and obedient to his law and to his commandments the statutes and his judgments but we have to learn to live by faith and to put God first in uh, the book of Luke chapter 18 the Messiah Yeshua Jesus Christ tells us about the importance of maintaining faith. He says in chapter 18 of Luke, verse 1, he spoke a parable to the, the disciples that they always ought to pray, always pray, and not to lose heart, not to faint, not to grow hopeless. <coughs> <coughs> He said to them, there was a, in a certain city a judge who did not fear God or regard man either. And there was a widow in that city. And she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. I've been mistreated. And he would not do it for a while. But afterward he said in his own heart, although I don't fear God and I don't regard man either, this widow is troubles troubles me she's pestering the daylights out of me so I will give her what she wants an avenger just to get rid of her <laughs> lest by her continual coming she wearies me and the Lord said hear what that unjust unrighteous godless corrupt judge said and he said shall God not avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them, patiently endures with them. He said, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily when the time comes. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, that is in our generation now, because we're living in the end time generation, and he says, when the Son of Man comes back, to this earth will he find faith on the earth? Apparently not very much. Apparently the vast majority are going to lose their faith during this time of tribulation and travail and distress and trouble and woe and grief and misery that's coming on the earth. People are going to give up and quit and lose their faith. <coughs> by the carloads but not everybody you know some will endure to the end as we read in the book of Revelation uh, a few weeks ago the Philadelphia church is blessed because they endure and God says to those that have the loving spirit 
the Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. He says, because, verse 10 of Revelation 3, because you have kept my command to persevere, to endure to the end, not to give up, not to lose heart, not to lose faith. I also will keep, preserve, or protect you from the hour of trial and testing and tribulation, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Hold fast what you have, he says, that no one, that no one may take or seize your crown, the crown of eternal life and righteousness and glory. So God wants us to endure in faith, and he wants us to be like Abraham. In the book of Romans, chapter 4, God tells us about Abraham, our forefather, also called the father of the faithful. And it says about Abraham, Romans chapter 4, be, and beginning in uh, verse 17. As it is written, I have made you, God said to Abraham, a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who, contrary to hope, that is, Abraham, in hope, believed God. So that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be, God said. And not being weak in faith, so many today are just weak in faith, and they're weak in obedience. He did not even consider his own body already dead, so to speak, since he was about a hundred years old. Nor did he consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. God had promised him a child. And here he was a hundred already. And Sarah was way up there in age, past childbearing age. But Abraham did not waver or vacillate at the promise of God through lack of faith or unbelief. But he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced and convicted that what God had promised, he was also able to do, to perform. And therefore this was counted to Abraham for righteousness. Faith is the way, the key to true righteousness. I want to read that in the living, not the living, <coughs> the parallel Bible, <coughs> amplified parallel Bible. I think it's, uh, I want to read it in the King James. I memorized that verse years ago in the King James. I just read it to you in the New King James. But the King James, I think, in this case, is even superior to the New King James. And in the King James it says in verse 18 that Abraham who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to what was spoken. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old. Neither yet did he consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. I like that. Mm -hmm. He staggered not. He didn't stagger mm -hmm. or trip mm -hmm. or fall. Yeah. But he was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded. See, he wasn't just partly persuaded. He didn't just, well, I think God will do what he said. He was fully, completely, totally persuaded. 
that what God had promised he was able also to do, to perform. And so it was granted to him as righteousness. Now the Amplified Bible has this also interesting. So I want to read it again because I want to I want these verses to have an impact on your thinking, on your life, on the way you look at God's word, the way you look at God, and the way you pray, and the way you obey and adhere to his commandments, because God will protect his people who trust in him and who obey him. But if we don't obey or don't do what he says, then we only have ourselves to blame. But he does promise to protect those who endure in faith and keep his commandments and serve him. That put him first. Although the whole world may go to hell in a handcart, we should remain faithful. We should be like the salmon that, that struggles and swims upstream and not just go downstream with the current. You know, but, but struggle against the current and go upstream. <clears throat> so the Amplified Bible says verse 19 Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered the utter impotence of his own body which was as good as dead because he was about a hundred years old or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's dead and womb no unbelief or distrust made him waver doubtingly question concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God. Fully satisfied and assured that God was able and mighty to keep his word and to do what he had promised. He was fully satisfied and assured in his heart and mind that God was able and mighty to perform the great works and to keep his word which he promised. God doesn't break his word. Sometimes we break our word. Sometimes we say one thing and do another. But God doesn't. God is not a hypocrite. God is like a pillar like a rock, like El Capitan, that mountain in Yosemite Park in California, this great basaltic, monolithic, huge, towering edifice of granite, solid granite, very imposing as you enter the Yosemite Valley in California. God is like that. He's a rock. He's faithful and solid. and We can trust him. <coughs> during the times ahead we need to learn to trust him and we need to learn to put his word first in our lives you know God called me to serve him about 50 well back in 1956 is when I was baptized on the island of Formosa that's about uh, 50 56 years ago, right? <laughs> and that's when I then came back from Formosa, or it's now called Taiwan. Uh, studying the Bible, I've been, we read the New Testament about five or six times at that point. And the missionary lady had given me a copy of the whole Bible, including the Old Testament. So I began. <coughs> <coughs> reading it on the way back from Formosa as we traveled on the uh, one of the U.S. troop transport ships sailing from the Orient back to back to San Francisco under the Golden Gate Bridge and I began reading about uh, oh just <coughs> I think about 50 chapters a night while I was on board that ship because I had a lot of time to read in the daytime during the night. 
So I read the book of Genesis and then Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and uh, Joshua and Judges and Ruth and, and I just kept reading and got into Chronicles and and all the genealogies and I got through them okay and I kept reading and I began to read the whole Bible and I was searching for the truth and I was heard, I heard uh, all kind of preachers on the radios we went back to Seattle Washington where my, my, where my dad was from and where we he retired there and became a builder and a contractor and I was in high school at the time and I began searching the airwaves on radio and even some television looking for all the Christian religious programs because I knew I had been called to serve God. When I was baptized it was after I'd given my life to God to do with whatever he wanted to do and I had no idea what that was but I had read in the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke that when Christ went through Galilee he called his disciples and he said to them come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men and I, I knew he had called me now that he was making me a fisher of men <laughs> to serve him like, like he called them and uh, so I was searching for reading the Bible every day and every night and searching for uh, the church that was most like what the Bible says the church would be like. And I went to King's Garden there in the north, north part of Seattle and that didn't seem to fill the bill and I tried a Baptist church there and that didn't fill the bill and, and I turned the radio to all these different programs back to the Bible and and uh, Dr. DeHaan uh, and other programs and I've got a little bit of everything even even a Catholic uh, J. Fulton Sheen but amongst those I also heard the World Tomorrow program mm -hmm. by Herbert W. Armstrong in those days and it came on at 1030 at night on radio station that was KVI I think in Seattle and I listened to that of course I also heard Billy Graham every week he was on you know, the hour of decision every Sunday Billy Graham The World Tomorrow was interesting it was on every night at 10.30 I began to listen and when I heard these programs if they had literature I sent for it often uh, I ordered books from one, one or two and Dr. DeHaan's booklets and and Billy Graham's out of, uh, I think it's called Decision Magazine and uh, others and I ordered The Plain Truth from Herbert W. Armstrong I read them all I wasn't very impressed with most of them they didn't say that much but I was learning a little bit here and there and then I finally it took forever it seemed like till the booklets came and magazines came from from the Radio Church of God and Herbert Armstrong as it was called then the Radio Church of God but they finally came big package of magazines and booklets and I read about Christmas being pagan and Easter being pagan and, and I read about uh, uh, wine is not forbidden to Christians with the Greek word oinos it means wine is actually means fermented wine uh, fermented grapes or a real wine that you could get drunk on if you drank too much so then I learned about the rapture Dr. DeHaan had sent me a booklet on the rapture and he said oh we're all waiting for that silent trumpet is going to blow no. silent trumpet that's going to no. blow and call all the Christians up to heaven and it's going to be a silent trumpet only the Christians will hear it in their minds and they'll zip up to heaven and uh, I, I, at that time I thought well, well alright uh, he had a whole booklet on it like 30 pages <coughs> I thought alright and then I heard Herbert Armstrong talking about the rapture on the uh, his program 
and I got the plain truth of some several issues, and I read the article there by Dr. Herman L. Hay about the secret rapture, fact or fiction, I think it was. And so I read it, you know, to see what he had to say. Oh, he just totally disagreed with Dr. DeHaan, and he showed how the Bible says when Christ comes, he's going to come back to this earth just like when he left from the Mount of Olives. And when he left, he just they saw him go out of, this, out of sight up into heaven. And he said when he comes back, the angel said, he's going to return just like he left, visibly. And then Dr. Hayes showed that it also says in Zechariah that when the Lord returns, he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives and fight all the nations that come up against Jerusalem. And of course, he showed that when he comes, he's going to, there's going to be the voice of an archangel and the, the blast of the trumpet of God and the dead are going to rise up, the dead from their graves. And he showed this occurs after the tribulation. Not like Dr. DeHaan said, before the tribulation. And not like J.R. Church and Gary Stearman and all these modern ministers are writing in their books and saying, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the pre tribulation rapture, they call it. No, I found that's, that's not what the Bible teaches. The sequence of events is right there in Matthew chapter 24, the Mount Olivet Prophecy. That you just go right through there, and Jesus gave a list of things that are going to happen in sequence before he comes. And one of those things that's listed there before he comes is the abomination of desolation in the temple of God, and persecution on Christians, and great tribulation. So bad is going to be so bad as that nothing ever happened before. That all life on earth would be threatened unless God cuts the days short. And then after that it says, you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory accompanied by his angels. After the tribulation. Well, so I, at that point I was about 16, 17, 18 years old. I rode into the college and began attending uh, the church up in the Seattle Tacoma area under Pastor Jimmy Friddle. And I went around with him several to church functions several times uh, with him and his wife. And they would they would drive to baptisms and church picnics and things. And in the first few months, I'd go with them. They'd pick me up and. And later I got access to my dad's car or truck, and so I'd drive myself to services. And with uh, Ken Coons, another fellow up in the Seattle area. And then I went to Ambassador College in 1959 as a freshman student. And before I graduated in 1963, I began writing articles for the Plain Truth magazine called Question Box Articles. And they hired me to work in the letter answering department, which is a ministerial department where we answered letters and Bible questions of people. And I turned out maybe five or six letters an hour. I was breaking records. I was such a fast writer. And uh, then I began writing articles for the Good News magazine and the Plain Truth in 1964. 65 and everybody was amazed at this young man writing all these articles and getting such a good response from listeners and readers and then after that I was sent out in the field uh, briefly to assist Dennis Luker in the San Francisco Bay Area and came back to Pasadena and uh, married Cappy Callahan mm -hmm. <laughs> my, my wife Capitola and uh, we, uh, after a whirlwind courtship and romance, uh, we got married September 24, uh, 1967. The very year that Mrs. Herbert Armstrong died in Pasadena. And the very year of the Six-Day War that occurred in Israel. 
when Israel conquered all the surrounding Arab nations in six days and recaptured the Golan Heights, the west bank of the Jordan, the Sinai Peninsula, and the eastern half of the city of Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount. Back in those days, we thought it won't be long before they rebuild the Temple. Well, time went by and they didn't rebuild the Temple, but progress was made and Orthodox Jews began to talk about it. They began to prepare for it and they're preparing today to rebuild the Temple in Israel. In fact, I have an article here that I just was reading today that came off the internet. A leading rabbi believes the temple will be rebuilt in his lifetime. And today is 2012, and the article says that in a documentary, a leading rabbi in Jerusalem says he believes the next Jewish temple will be rebuilt on the Temple Mount in his lifetime. And he says everything is now ready to build that temple today. Everything's ready. Rabbi Nachman Kahani, the rabbi who's guided many Jewish students of the scriptures on the subject of the temple, has been the main source of serious study and preparations to build the Jewish temple. Because that is what the Bible calls for. Rabbi Kahani's uh, school, called the Yeshiva, a place of learning for Jewish young men, they are, in that school he trained all the leaders of the effort to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And it was his students who started up the Temple Mount Institute, who have accumulated now all the implements needed for the next temple and he trained the men to operate the temple as priests and Levites. The article says, all the preparations have been made to rebuild the next Jewish temple in Jerusalem, which is in essence a page out of Bible prophecy for the end times. 20 years ago, the writer says, I sat with Rabbi Nachman Kahani, as he was beginning his quest to rebuild the Jewish temple on the Temple Mount. Now, 20 years later, so that was uh, 1992, 20 years ago. Now, 20 years later, the rabbi believes that the temple will indeed be rebuilt in his lifetime. That is a quote from the rabbi on a documentary released on the subject that shows the rabbi plus many others who also agree that the temple could be standing in Jerusalem and in the very near future. Rabbi Yehuda Glick, the former head of the Temple Institute, says even the priestly garments are ready and the temple will stand in full operation very soon. Rabbi Kain Richman, who is the leading authority on the Red Heifer, says the temple will be built at the spot of the original site of the Garden of Eden, which he says is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Somewhere on that Temple Mount. Rabbi Yoel Karen says that there will be a Jewish temple in Jerusalem that follows the details in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 46. But first, the Jewish people will build a less extravagant temple as they did when the second temple was rebuilt 2,500 years ago in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. The article says the priests now have been trained. The implements are ready and made to, op to operate the temple. Even the menorah, the seven branch candelabra is ready. And there are ten stringed harps for the Levites to play 
is called for by King David. <laughs> the prophecy is marching on. But something's got to happen to break loose things, the log jam, the roadblock in the Middle East to permit this to happen. And I think the, this year, 2012, is a year of transition and a year of change. Massive changes are going to occur this year. And they're probably going to be introduced because of war. Now, I believe the temple is going to be rebuilt since I first began studying prophecy back in the 1950s and 1960s. And I was in the Worldwide Church of God. As I said, I, I, I did not go into the Worldwide Church of God as a young man, gently or willingly, uh, just being duped into it. When I first heard Mr. Armstrong on the radio, that I began reading the literature, my first reaction was, wait a minute, he's not preaching the same thing as Billy Graham or Dr. DeHaan or these others. He's got a different approach. He's teaching things that totally disagree with mainstream Christianity. He says Christmas is pagan. Easter's pagan. Then I got the book that on the Sabbath showing we ought to keep the seventh day Sabbath instead of Sunday every week as the day of rest and worship. And I read the article on the rapture and I found out the churches were teaching that wrong. So I went to Ambassador College but before I did, I remember being with a scout troop. I thought I was a Boy Scout, and I was getting my Eagle Scout there with my brother up in Seattle. We were having a summer camp in the Olympic Peninsula, a week-long, six, five or six or seven days of hiking and camping up in the Olympics. And I was searching for the truth in those days. I was really trying to know what God wanted me to do. And which way I should go? That was Billy Graham, and I'd read his book, World of Fire or World of Flame or something, and <coughs> he preached repentance, and he preached Christ, but that's about all he preached. Then I got confused about what he seemed to teach about predestination or something, and it got a little confusing. But I wanted to find the truth. So I read what Herbert Armstrong had to write and most had to write and what he had to say and and I found truth. I proved it. I, but I was skeptical. I prayed to God to help me find the truth, Lord. Help me to see what the truth is. I pray you'll keep me from deception, from being deceived, because I knew somebody was lying. Somebody wasn't telling the truth. And I won, and at first I thought it was probably him. Herbert Armstrong was probably lying and leading me off. So I determined every book that I got, every article I got from them, I opened my Bible, I looked up the scriptures, and I read the scriptures. I didn't just read what was said in the article. I verified it by reading the scriptures. Quoted or just referred to, I read them anyway. And I began to memorize the Bible, vast portions of it. <coughs> and I came to see that Herbert Armstrong was preaching the truth. The truth about the Sabbath, the truth about the holy days, as far as keeping them was concerned. Nobody else taught that anywhere. So I thought, wow. It says right there in Exodus and Leviticus, these days are God's days and they are to be observed forever. How long is forever? Well, I figure it would sure includes today. <laughs> you know, so I came to say he was teaching the truth as far as I was capable of understanding it and proving it at that time. <coughs> and so I made the decision to go to Ambassador College and I began writing articles proving these things for other people, helping them to prove the truth. 
you know, and this was these were wonderful days. They 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 had their problems. People weren't perfect. The church wasn't perfect. Nobody was perfect. I saw problems in the college. I had to get down on my knees and pray to God to help me see what He wanted me to do. A lot of times, but I knew I felt He really wanted me to endure, to stay faithful and to endure, because I could tell there's nowhere else to go. Nobody else was preaching the Sabbath and the holy days and about the unclean meats and about prophecy and the U.S. and British Commonwealth and prophecy. You know, I, I figured these things I have proven. And so I decided to stick with the truth. Then about 1974, people in the church began to depart and uh, leave the church because of disagreements. And 1974 is when the, well, what do you want to say, the, <laughs> the bad stuff hit the fan, let's say. Uh, <coughs> up until then there had been a few scandals in the church. There was a scandal about 1965 when a couple of ministers were put out of the church for allegedly committing adultery. And it came to be known at that time that Ted Armstrong had been involved, but he hadn't been put out of the church. He'd been given a slap on the wrist and told not to do it anymore, but they couldn't put him out because he was an evangelist right under his dad in the church. And his so he, so he got by, but uh, he was warned not to do it. But about 1972-74, it came to light once again that, well, Ted Armstrong was up to his old tricks, committing adultery with college students and others. So he was sent out in the field and uh, kind of reprimanded and, and disfellowshipped briefly, disciplined, and then allowed back in. And he came back, and I remember attending a ministerial conference in Pasadena that year, and I, I'd heard about these things through the grapevine, and I was angry. I was so angry that these things were happening, and they were being covered up. I was furious. But I was not an ordained minister. I was in a ministerial work and capacity, writing articles and so forth, but they didn't lay hands on me. My ministry comes from God and from Christ, like the Apostle Paul. I was called by God, not by men. But the Ted, at that ministerial conference, got up there in front of everybody, all these ministers, and said, well, I've sinned. I've, I've fallen in love with a woman who's not my wife, this, this young woman by the name of Gail. And she was a stewardess on his jet, the Falcon jet. And uh, he chased her all around, trying to uh, run off with her. And then I later got a letter personally from her husband, or someone that had been married to her, because she later died, saying that she never loved Ted and was not his girlfriend. She was afraid of him and ran away from him, and he raped her. And, and you know, I just thought, how horrible. And this was all covered up by Herbert Armstrong trying to, quote, protect the church and the income for the church because the church runs on its income. And I was furious. This was 1974. And a lot of ministers learned about this. And <coughs> I think about 70, 80 ministers left the church and started to take congregations with them. And Herbert nipped that in the bud by sending new ministers out to all those congregations and disfellowshipped all the ministers who were leaving or who were going to preach the truth about Ted's hanky-panky and, and also doctrinal disturbances. They had some doctrinal meetings at that time on the issue of divorce and remarriage because the church had always taught that you can't remarry. Once you're married, you can't get a divorce. And so they had a terrible time teaching that with people that had been divorced maybe two or three times and they came in the church 
and they're already remarried and had children, what are they going to do? Have to dissolve the marriage? And the leadership said, yes, you have to go back to your original wife or just split the family. And they yeah. tortured people. And people committed suicide. Well, then the, at that time, this whole issue came up for a restudy. And uh, uh, Lyle Christopherson, a pilot on the one of the church aircraft that was giving me a ride from Pasadena, or from, no, not Pasadena, but from uh, Dallas, Texas to Big Sandy campus there. I was going to interview H. Ross Perot for an article. And I happened to sit up in the cockpit with him on, in the church's plane, and he gave me this little booklet by Guy Duty, D-U-T-Y, on, on divorce and marriage. He said, have you read this? And I said, no. He said, well, you ought to read it. The church is not teaching right on this subject. So I read it, studied it, and I found out he was telling the truth. The church was wrong. And this is when this whole issue blew up in 1974. And that's the same time when the issue of Pentecost came up before the church. And Herbert Armstrong was, I had always taught since 1936 or 1937 that Pentecost should be observed on a Monday every year. Then I came to find out that well originally Herbert Armstrong taught Pentecost like the Jews taught. You observe it on Sivan 6, counting from the day after Passover. But then he changed to Bundy about uh, 1937, 38. And you have to go back and read some of the old literature and letters and things to get the real scoop on that, but that's the fact. And then he changed to Monday, but no one kept it on Monday except him. Then in 1974, the subject came before the church again through Raven McNair and Dr. Ernest Martin, and they were teaching that it ought to be kept on Sunday because when you count Pentecost, you, you count beginning with the day, day number one. You don't count a way out from day number one. This whole thing was arguing over how to count. You, you know, it was a big joke in my mind. They never determined how to count, and Herbert decided back in the 30s, well, when you count the Pentecost, you count beginning with the day after the first day. So you count 50 days from Sunday, he said. You start with Monday. You count 50 days, you end up on a Monday. But normally when you say count from 1 to 10, do you start with 2? <laughs> well, no, you start with 1. I say count from 1 to 10. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You count inclusively, not exclusively. You don't exclude day one, because then if you count ten, you wind up with day eleven. See what I'm saying? Yes. Well, this came up in 1974, and so Herbert Armstrong was being badgered and pressed by by Ray, by my friend Raymond McNair whose book I published on the Scent to Greatness. He was one of my friends. And he kept trying to get to Mr. Armstrong to listen. And finally, Mr. Armstrong exploded and said, Raymond, you got a demon. You're under demon influence. And Raymond just gently, quietly said, Well, Mr. Armstrong, look at this. And look at this. And look at this translation. Finally, Mr. Armstrong had enough and said, All right, let's consult with the Jewish ambassador's wife. Because the church was trying to make inroads in Israel. So he called, they called the Jewish ambassador and talked to the wife and how to count Pentecost. And I've written this up in an article. And they said, What well, do you count exclusively? Or inclusively, do you, do you begin with the day? When you say count from, you begin with that day or the next day? And she said, oh, well, you begin f from that day itself. That's the first day. 
he said that's the way the Jews have always done it and uh, so they said oh they wiped the sweat off their brows and said now we got proof that <coughs> the church has been wrong all these years so they switched counting uh, to inclusive counting and so if you count from Sunday like the Sadducees did you wind up on a Sunday every year so the church changed on that and Herbert Armstrong was convinced but Dr. Hay was not convinced he told me in his office sitting down he said well I'm going to keep both days <laughs> he won't go against the church or Mr. Armstrong but he would keep both days another minister Raymond C. Cole got all hot and bothered about this and he said no we will not change he would not change so he was disfellowshipped and put out of the church and he had a little church group up in Oregon and <coughs> some of them didn't begin to follow him because they knew him as their minister and he said Herbert Armstrong was wrong and sinning and adulterating the truth that God revealed all the truth back in the 1930s and this was apostasy in his eyes but you know what? The truth is, they were both wrong. The truth is, first of all, Mr. Armstrong did not begin keeping Pentecost on a Monday. From 1934 until 1937 or so, he kept it on the same day the Jews do. See that six. So if we go back to when he began, the, the day he began keeping, he first revealed to him we'd keep the same day the Jews do. Then he went off into error. In 1974, he corrected one error, but still was wrong because he was still counting from the wrong day. You see, we're to count from the day after Passover, not from the weekly Sabbath that occurs during unleavened bread. <coughs> Well, that's what he originally did, together with the Jews. That's when the Jews count, beginning with the day after Passover. But Raymond Cole left the church and started his own church called the Church of God the Eternal. And now it's in the hands of another man because he died. And before he died, he was accused of adultery with his secretary, and he stole money from church members that they, they gave him to hold for them, and then he took it according to what they told me thousands of dollars but then he, he died and now this other man is in charge of that church and then somebody who was used to be in that church had the audacity last week to ask me on the, on the phone after the Bible study he had the audacity to ask me and say why well you know, you knew all this corruption was going on in the church back in the 1970s. Stanley Rader and Kessler Cornwall and all the things, their influence on Herbert Armstrong, you knew that. Uh, but why did you stay in the church? He said, you didn't get out of the church for another 10 years. Because you see, I think what he was getting at was Raymond Cole was disfellowshipped in 1974. But really, that was over the Pentecost issue. But he began bringing up th these other sins, which I'd learned about these other sins <coughs> at that time. But my, my reaction was, well, wait a minute. Yes, the church is sinning. Yes, there's been cover-ups. But nobody else is preaching the truth that I have proven. I've proven all these things. And I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm not going to reject the truth just because men sin. Like Paul said in the book of Romans, chapter 3, Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. And David said in the Psalms, All men are liars. So it behooves, behooves each one of us to get down in the nitty-gritty, get down on our knees and pray, and get down on our knees and study the Word of God and prove the truth like the Bereans did in the book of Acts where it says these were more noble than the ones in Thessalonica 
Acts chapter 17, verse 11. The Bereans are more noble than the men in, in Thessalonica because they studied the scriptures daily to see if what the apostle preached was true or not. And because they did that, it says many believed. Well, that's what happened to me back in the 1950s. I searched the scriptures daily proving the truth. Was it Billy Graham telling the truth or Dr. DeHaan or somebody else or was it Herbert Armstrong? Or was it the Jehovah Witnesses? Or was it the Adventists? I knuckled down, I studied to the thoroughly, diligently and everything I studied, I looked up the scriptures and every booklet. And I proved that Herbert Armstrong, as far as I could tell, was teaching the truth on everything I read. Except a couple things I wasn't sure about, but they were kind of tangential. They weren't basic doctrine. They were things where I didn't know one way or the other. Well, this was, to my dad, this was fanaticism on my part. He didn't want me following Herbert Armstrong. He was an ex-Navy man, so he he sicked a Jehovah Witness on me. <laughs> this was up in Seattle. I was still in high school, and he was building houses, and I was working with him when I was able to. And he got a Jehovah Witness man, the local leader or director of the Jehovah Witness group in Seattle, to come out and talk to me. So he came to visit, and we sat down and had a nice discussion. I think it lasted about an hour and a half or two or two hours, maybe three hours. And we talked about the faith. Mainly we talked about obedience to God versus grace. And he was trying to show me that the law of God is done away. We're not under the law anymore. We don't have to keep the Sabbath and, and the law is done away. And I showed him again and again that the law is not done away. Paul said the law is spiritual, and that which is spiritual is eternal. And Paul called the law holy and just and good. Romans 7, chapter 7 of Romans, verses 12 and 14, and maybe verse 7. Anyway, we had a long discussion, and finally we talked about healing. We talked about the nature of Christ. Was he God, or was he an angel? And they they. they said there's only one God, God the Father. Christ is not God. So I turned to John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So it's right there plain as day. But then they showed me their translation, and they had the word God in the small g. <laughs> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, small g. <laughs> and I thought, that's ridiculous. You know, it says he's with God, they're one. He himself said the Father and I are one. So he is the Son of God. Then I turned him over to Hebrews chapter 1, where God the Father speaks of Christ, very plainly saying that let all the angels of God worship him. And it says of the Christ, the Messiah, it says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Speaking of Christ. So I felt I nailed his butt to the wall. I nailed his hide to the shed. But he wouldn't agree with me, so I said, Well, <coughs> that's it, you believe in divine healing. He said, Oh, no, 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 we don't believe in that. So I turned him to uh, James chapter 5, <coughs> verses 14 through 16, where it says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them anoint him with oil, and pray over them. You know, and it says, you know, God's ministers are, are to pray for the sick. God does heal today. But he wouldn't believe that either. He said, well, I don't see any reason to talk to you anymore. I think you better leave. <laughs> so 
You know, I had to defend the faith, defend the truth that I was proving. Well, in 1974, a lot of my friends, ministers, left the church, but I felt they left for the wrong reasons. They they got smarty pants, they got big heads, pride and vanity came in. They wanted to replace the church that God had started through Mr. Armstrong and just go out and start all over again their own local churches with an association of God's church with men that I'd gone through college with. <coughs> and they began changing doctrines. And they did away with the British Israel doctrine. They did away with with uh, even the tithing doctrine, which we, we know is the law of God. It says so in the Bible. Old and New Testaments. And they did away with... Uh, well, what else? It, it did away with church government. The, and, the, of course, and they changed divorce and remarriage. But at that time, the church itself changed the teachings on divorce and remarriage. So that was no longer an issue. So they, those men left the church, not for the reason that Raymond Cole did. They had no argument about Pentecost. But they left for mainly because of the hanky panky of Ted Armstrong and all of his sexual liaisons. He confessed to having had sex with hundreds of women in a confession to the the board of ministers. And Herbert just covered it up. Well, you know, th this was a time of great trial and testing in the church, and a very time of great trial and testing for me personally, because I was disgusted. I was sick. I was ready to throw up. I was ready to <laughs> do something. Yeah, what could I do? I was not a minister. I was not an evangelist. I was not a leader in the church. I was a writer. And the church was still preaching the truth. Even though the hypocrites were running the church, the truth is the truth. And like Paul said, though God, let God be true, let the truth be the truth. Even though every man's a liar and covering up and being a, a sinner, that's between them and God. As long as the truth is the truth, and I'm going to follow the truth. Well, so that's why I did not leave the church. I, I stayed in the church until God showed me where to go and what to do. I was praying for God to change the church. Then I was let go at that very same time and stopped working for the church and began writing books, preserving the truth. A book on proof of God, the first Genesis, Keys of Radiant Health, Children's Creation Book, The Last Days of Planet Earth, books on uh, overcoming Satan, Escape from Armageddon. I was writing books and circulating them and published them and publishing them and uh, preserving the truth, the, doc the doctrines and the teachings of the Bible. I didn't just give up and quit. I had no endorsement from the church, but they couldn't condemn me either because I wasn't going astray and teaching false doctrine. I was teaching the truth as I understood it and as the church taught it. But then about... Uh, Ten years later, in 1987, actually, after Herbert Armstrong died, he died January 16, I think, 1986, and then Joe Takach took over the church. And a year later, January 16, 1987, he sent uh, three, uh, two ministers to my home to put me out of the church, accusing me of teaching falsely in trying to teach uh, <coughs> uh, trying well just going against what her uh, going against Joe Takachi's new regime because because I'd written a letter to a man in Australia and said well I'm not convinced that what direction the church is going now <laughs> you know we have to wait and see the fruits they didn't like that and I was, and I, I was beginning to publish a newsletter at that time <coughs> 
on called Prophecy Flash. And they did not approve of that. So they came and said, we, you're not allowed to do this and and you're, you're uh, suspended from church. The next week they came back and said, you're put out of the church. You're disfellowshipped. The third week they blasted my name around the world from the pulpit saying I was marked. They marked me and all of that. And during this time I fasted three days and three nights with no food, no water, and I inquired of God what I should do. They said, well, if you want to come back in the church, you can contact one of your evangelist friends, you know, and try to work it out through them. And <laughs> I thought, are you kidding? So I prayed and fasted, and God showed me what he wanted me to do. God said, in effect, in uh, two things, he said. He led me to the scriptures in Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. The Apostle Peter and the Apostle John they were brought before the Sanhedrin and beaten and they were commanded not to teach in the name of Christ anymore. They, they, they were said, You filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Verse 28. And uh, Verse 29, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And that scripture just blazed out at me. I shouldn't follow these men anymore. I would obey God. That's what Peter said. We ought to obey God rather than men. They were falsely accusing me and putting me out of the church for no godly reason whatsoever. I hadn't done anything wrong. But they didn't like the fact I was publishing a newsletter and that I was selling books. The church had tolerated my books for about 10 years. But now with the new Takachi administration, they weren't going to tolerate anything. God showed me I should obey God rather than men. And how should I do that? As Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9 and verse 10. He said, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. All your strength and energy and power you possess. For there is no work or device or knowledge in the grave where we're all going when we die. So in the meantime, while we're alive, we should serve God with all of our might, whatever your hand finds to do. And God had given me the opportunity to write books and publish a newsletter. And now he gave me the opportunity to begin speaking conducting Bible studies and Sabbath services. And he said to me, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Put all your energy and effort into it. Don't serve the Lord lily-dilly or, <laughs> or weakly, pusillanimously, don't serve the Lord in weakness, but serve Him in strength. And Jeremiah says, Don't serve the Lord crookedly, but serve Him righteously. If I can. Find where that is. It's been a while since I looked that up. Don't serve the Lord deceitfully, but with truth and in truth. Because I found out that the Worldwide Church of God was going astray. It was going downhill rapidly. 
There was hypocrisy amongst the top ministers and there was hypocrisy in all those who left the church to begin their own churches. And there was hypocrisy with the so-called Church of God the Eternal. They totally destroyed the truth about Pentecost. And Jeremiah says in chapter 5 of Jeremiah, verse 30, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land, the land of Israel. The prophets prophesy falsely. The preachers preach falsehood, error. And the priests rule by their own power. And my people, God said, love to have it that way. The people were compromising. The people were laying a sin in attitude. They were miserable and blind and naked and say, oh, we're rich, we're rich in spirituality. But God said, no, you're not rich. You're poverty-stricken. Poor and miserable and blind and naked, he said. The people love their ministers. They want to follow their ministers. And so if a minister leaves, they leave with him. And so the United Church broke off and a bunch of ministers went and their people went with them. Now the United Church is split again and the ministers that split off, their people went with them and the others stayed with the others. The Living Church got started with Rod Meredith and then it was originally called the Global Church. And it split down the middle and well actually most of the people followed Rod Meredith into the living church and the global church went defunct, bankrupt. And those ministers later did something else for a living or maybe they joined the uh, living, the United Church, I should say. And then the United Church split because of the influence of some of those dastardly ministers and God calls them false prophets. They're the false ministers and the false teachers and the false prophets because they are not proving the doctrine and the truth. I've presented the truth to Gerald Flurry. He rejected it with a high hand. I presented the truth, I'm talking about the basic truth now, on Passover and Pentecost. Relatively easy things to prove. They rejected it out of hand. Rod Meredith rejected it out of hand. United Church, I presented it to them and to Raymond McNair and to Dennis Luker. The United Church rejected it out of hand because I presented it to the church back in the days before these churches even got started. To the Worldwide Church of God, I presented it. Though they rejected it. Joe Takach, of course, had already put me out of the church. He wasn't going to listen to anything. So it's a case-by-case, case, person by person scenario. God opens the minds of those whom he calls and whom he chooses. And once God opens your mind and you see the truth, your job is to hang on to it with both hands. Grab a hold. Don't let anyone steal your crown or take your crown or take your salvation or lead you astray. We're all commanded, as I said last week, I think it was, or two weeks ago rather, line up on line, line up on line, here a little, there a little, here a little, there a little. we got to put it all together and study and prove all things, like Paul said. And, and uh, rightly divide the word of truth. How do you do that? By studying. By getting on your knees and praying and studying. So that's that's why I did not leave the church of my own volition. I tried to remain faithful to the teachings of God, looking to God to change the situation in the church. And he did. He allowed Herbert Armstrong to die, he allowed Joe Takach to take over, then I was disfellowshipped then I was free to obey God and teach the truth and he began this ministry 
through me of Triumph Prophetic Ministries. I wasn't dilatory or late or slack concerning the promises of God or obedience to God. I was obeying God all the way through. If people read my books, they knew even in the book Escape from Armageddon, I was warning about the hypocrisy in the end time church. That we have modern day Pharisees leading the church and that God commands us all to look at the fruits and prove all things. Now, that's what gets me, you know, I've had a lot of friends from the old times and World War Church of God, they don't look to the fruits anymore. They're not busy proving all things. They're not searching the scriptures. Like one man's wife said, well, we proved all that years and decades ago. So she won't even look. How does she know she proved it? Maybe she just swallowed it whole. Now hook, line, and sinker. People don't study, they don't prove, they take for granted. They're following personalities instead of trembling before the Word of God. You know, why, why didn't I just get up and leave like so many others did? Because I loved the truth. And I wasn't going to get up and leave the truth or the only church that I do preaching the truth and just go nowhere into the desert by myself. You know, I wanted to serve God and as long as this church was serving God, even if it wasn't perfect, I'd trust God either to clean up the church or to spew it out of his mouth. I waited patiently. And you know what happened? God spewed the church out of his mouth. <laughs> but prior to that time, they spewed me out of their mouth. That's all right. I'd rather serve God and be rejected by men than to serve men and be rejected by God. You know, my attitude, really, brethren, was like that of David. We read in the book of Samuel that God sent that first of all Saul was the king over Israel. And Saul had become, with a big head, a giant inflated ego. Maybe kind of like Herbert Armstrong in his later years. Saul was a king, but he was anointed by Samuel, the prophet of God. God chose Saul, but then Saul got a big head and went astray. When Samuel didn't show up at a certain time, at a certain place, when Saul expected, he did the sacrifice himself, showing he was not obedient to God. When God commanded Saul to go down to kill the Amalekites <coughs> and slay them all including their cattle and their sheep Saul came back from this victory with all their cattle and sheep and even their king alive and Samuel went up to him and said what is this you've done the Lord commanded you to kill these things and Saul said oh I've obeyed the voice of the Lord the people made me do it he said the people wanted to keep the animals. Well, God rejected Saul. He said, you no longer be my king. So God sent Samuel to anoint David to be the next king. And David was anointed. Then he went out as a young man and slew Goliath on the battlefield with a, a slang shot or a slang and a small stone and faith. He had faith. He looked to God <coughs> to give him strength. And David became very popular among the Israelites and the young women would sing songs with playing their tambourines and dancing. Saying, David, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was grievously jealous and enraged and maddened by this. So he tried to throw a spear or javelin and spear David to the wall as David was playing on his guitar or harp <coughs> soothing music for Saul. 
So David fled for his life. And there are several opportunities David had to kill Saul in a cave. And while Saul was out chasing after him to kill him, but David refrained. He would not do that. He said, God forbid that I should touch or slay the Lord's anointed. The Lord forbid. And he, he didn't do it. He was on the run. He was disfellowshipped, you could, you could say. Well, I was disfellowshipped from Worldwide. I was no longer working for Worldwide for 10 years there. Uh, while Herbert Armstrong was still alive, they were going downhill. And I was like David. I wasn't going to do anything against the church, against spiritual Israel, or against the Lord's anointed. I considered Mr. Armstrong the Lord's anointed, his minister, to whom he revealed a lot of this truth, and no one, nobody else had it. He did go astray, but that's between him and God. You know, I, I did not uh, want to take it upon myself to be a rebel or to rebel. So I did not leave. That's why. I, I'm not a rebel. I did not want to rebel. But then when Joe Takach took over, they put me out of the church. So now God gave me free reign and license to obey him with no structure in between. I didn't have to look to the church anymore. And Joe Takach, they had severed the connection. They had cut the umbilical cord. That was just between me and God. And I elected and decided I would serve God with my whole heart, mind, soul, being, and strength. That I, that I wasn't not worthy, but I'm still going to do it. And I'd written since uh, 1974, I wrote nine books on proof of God, health loss of God, prophecy, beyond Star Wars, overcoming Satan, Satan's fate, and so forth. And then in the beginning 1987, I began Prophecy Flash magazine and, and going out to you know 30 people and 40 people, 60 people, 100 people, 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000 and then new people and old people would fall off and new people would be added and people began writing me letters and one man from New Jersey wrote me and said well why does the Worldwide Church of God keep Pentecost on a different day than the Jews? <laughs> you know, I got that letter from him and I, my eyes bugged out. I popped open and I said, what? Do they, is that right? Do they keep a different day? So I looked up in the Bible dictionaries and studied it out, studied the letter, and I found out that he was right. And I couldn't understand it either. I'd been taught by the Worldwide Church of God, Herbert Armstrong, how to count Pentecost, but until then I didn't know they were counting wrong. And why? So I began writing about Pentecost. And I began writing about the Passover. I found the church was keeping the wrong day of Passover. In fact, they weren't even keeping the Passover. And God said in Leviticus 23 and Exodus 14, the Passover is ordained forever. The statute forever and ever. And yet they admitted, Ted Armstrong said, we don't keep the Passover to the Church of God uh, International when he was in that church. He said, we don't keep the Passover or Church of God Intercontinental. He said, we keep the Lord's Supper. <laughs> well, I see the Bible says you're to keep the Passover forever. I see no commandment anywhere to keep the Lord's Supper. The Lord kept his own supper. It was a going away supper with the disciples. It was not the Passover. They had bread there, artos, leavened bread. The Passover, you're not allowed to have leavened bread. It has to be a zumos, unleavened, for Passover. So, you know, I've written all this till it's almost like it's coming out my ears. 
I've written article after article, five, 10, 15 articles on the Passover, short articles, long articles, big articles, little articles, article of Jesus last week, how long was Christ in the grave, articles on Christmas and Easter being pagan, articles on Pentecost, the Pentecost enigma, the truth about Pentecost, uh, how to count Pentecost, the whole meaning of Pentecost, the symbolism of Pentecost. You know, I've tried to nail it down and make it plain to people, and I find the worst problem is a lot of people just don't care. They've just been inundated with so much falderall and balderdash and deception, and they just don't seem to care anymore. They're not proving all things. They don't love the truth. And God says in, the, in Paul's uh, second book of Thessalonians, that those who love the truth will be saved. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, about verse 10. But if you don't have the love of the truth, you will not be saved. Jeremiah chapter 9 God asks this question of each one of us Jeremiah 9 verse 12 he says who is the wise man who may understand this and who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken that he may declare it why does the land perish and burn up like a wilderness so that no one can pass through? Why has the church of God gone astray? Why have the end time churches all refused to repent and change their ways before the Lord? Verse 13 says, And the Lord Yahweh said, Because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them and have not obeyed my voice nor walked according to it but they have walked according to the dictates of their own hearts and after the Baals the Baals which their fathers taught them So God says, because the people have that attitude, therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them, this people, with wormwood, and give them water of gall to drink, bitterness and poison, and scatter them among the Gentiles until I have consumed them. We're living in the midst of an end time conspiracy. An end time conspiracy of the shepherds and ministers of Israel. God says in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 21, For the shepherds have become dull hearted and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper and all their flocks, their congregations, shall be scattered. And that is the problem with the church today. And it's up to each one of us, brethren, to seriously prove where God is working where the truth is being taught and then to cling to it, to hang on to it, lay hold of eternal life as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 and if we do that God will bless us and we will prosper.
and we will gain entrance into the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord for his promises. And let's not stagger at the promises of God, but be filled with faith and endure to the end with living faith.